Hi folks, welcome back, and hi to all the new subscribers. Numbers have been going up pretty good lately, and I do appreciate it. And I know I don't bug you enough to subscribe and hit the like button, but you're adults, most of you. Enough said. Tonight's going to be a little short video. As you can see here, I have two spindles for a Monarch 10EE lathe. Uh, this is the original spindle. It's bent. The bearings are shot. The nose has been ground off to where it was in a wreck. They tried to make it to where I guess it could be usable or somebody was trying to hide it to save their job. After the wreck, each one of the ends of the spindles was out two thousandths of an inch. That's a heck of a lot for a uh, Monarch 10EE. Uh, if, if I'm right, and I may be wrong, but I read somewhere that the standard was 50 millionths of an inch run out, and you could order it with 30 millionths of an inch run out as an option. So this just won't work. The bearings that are in here, this is a separator, and these are the two bearings. This is a special flange bearing that some people say you can get. You can buy one from Monarch, but it was $2,800 for those two bearings. This is an unknown aged 10EE spindle that Terry from uh, Canada graciously donated to the cause. It has a set of bearings already on it. Uh, they were loose and the screws are, mess, are missing out of this uh, nut that puts tension against all of it. But they feel really good. Nothing like these growly things. It's got a little flat spot in it right there. It gets easy. You know, it's real easy. Then it gets hard. Yeah, that wreck killed that. And check your dead gum lace when you're buying one. That's an expensive repair. If you had to buy it from Monarch, I don't know what it would cost you. $2,800 for the bearings, whatever else for the spindle. That being said, I went ahead and pulled the spindle out of the 10 ee I'll show you that film. I just wanted to make something short for you. For all those people addicted to TikTok. This ain't TikTok around here because I try to show you things so that you'll understand and new people coming along can follow behind me and say, ah, I know what to do. I may not do it right the way most people like, but I get her done. This spindle and this spindle have all the same diameters. They have all the same keyways. This up here, this, this gear right here is for the tachometer and it fits right in here and there's a key for it there. This fits really nice on both shafts so I know the, the diameters are okay. The distance in the spacer is equal on both sides. Let, let me, I'll tell you what, let me get you a little close up. You don't need to be looking at my ugly face all the time, do you? Hell no. We can't take any more. How's that? All right. Like I said, all of these keyways are the same. There's six keys. There's one up here for the tachometer. This is the, the tack that goes right here. There's a few differences. And the question is, can I make it work? The first difference that you see is this, what looks like a pulley right here. But this is the inner race of a labyrinth seal. A labyrinth seal is a special oil seal that doesn't touch any of the other parts. It's 
it, it just free. What it does is the design of it, and there's a corresponding groove on the uh, the casting. It makes oil path through this so torturous, the oil just doesn't go through there. And then if it does, there's a, a drain inside there, uh, inside the casting, that allows it to get back to the sump. And if it gets too much, it'll leak out through the nose. There's a hole in this plate here with a through hole that will uh, drain the excess out. This is missing from this. This is just a standard nut that is pushed against there. It, it doesn't really do the preload because this ground spacer here has been ground to those bearings and, and that takes care of the preload. Hold on. Peter decided to come on. Anyway, this nut here and this are different. They perform the same function with the exception of this being a better oil seal. This nut on here is missing the uh, set screws and one of the little brass plugs that's underneath. Oh, you can see it, but this one's still in there. This one has all its parts. So, Measuring all of this, it looks to be exactly the same thickness and everything. So I can transfer this laver seal, and probably that nut too because it's in better shape, over to this, and that'll be fine. As we go down the shaft, this is the same. This is the same. The length of this uh, spline here is the same. The rest of it's the same here. The one major problem that I see is this oil groove is not here. Well, I can put this on a grinder and grind an oil groove in there. That's very shallow. Uh, that's what I assume it is. I don't know, but I can make that happen. Then you get down and you look at this area right here. From here to here is much shorter than from here to here. In fact, it's about three-eighths of an inch shorter over here than here. And what this area does is it supports the two rear uh, bearings in the headstock. And it's right at an inch and a half from this oil groove here to here. In fact, I'm not even sure that one's needed on this one. The problem is, if you go from this area down to here, here to here, it's a different length by three-eighths of an inch. And the main bearing takes up from this area to three-quarter inch, then there's another one that goes from here to here. So there are two stack bearings that take up an inch and a half of space. Well, this shaft, the replacement shaft, doesn't have three-eighths of an inch of this. From there on out, everything's exactly the same. So the major difference is, is this race area for the bearing is three-eighths of an inch shorter and there's what I take to be an oil groove here. This, the shaft's the same diameter on each side. It doesn't step down. This has just been a relief in there. It needs that. All right. Any questions? Yes, you in the back. Well, Steve, what the hell are you going to do about that? Well, let me get you situated where you can see me. I have a plan. I'm going to take off this labyrinth bearing, put it over here, and get this all set up. That should be fine. No problems there. Tachometer will fit. No problem. All the clutch for shifting to back gear and all that up here. No problem. Oil ring, or oil groove, excuse me. 
there's no ring goes in there. It's, I just think it's there for, I, I don't know. The end of the race goes there. But if I need it, I can put that in on a grinder. Uh, this will fit in between. I can make a plug here, plug up here, put centers on it, and away we go. Just lightly grind another ring. The real $64,000 question is what do I do about this being short? Now, in the real world, I don't really think that being 3 eighths of an inch short on a dual bearing that's an inch and a half long would make a heck of a lot of difference. True, this, the very outboard bearing would only be supported by three eighths of an inch and then the rest of it would hang over here to the side. But it shouldn't affect the alignment in any way and both bearings should be turning but I've come up with what I think will work. Now, you work with the tools that you have. I currently do not have a cylindrical grinder that can handle this all in one piece. Uh, I have a tool and cutter grinder that I can put between centers this shaft and, or spindle and be able to grind that in just by rotating the shaft and grinding slowly. I can do that. I don't have a lot of hope of putting something here and grinding it down to this. If it's off a little bit, I've screwed up. So what I decided to do was the first try, and I can always come back. I went out in my scrap pile and I found a piece of 303 stainless. It's just there. I've got it. It machines well. I think me and old Bob are going to put this on the, the machine and I'm going to make a sleeve that's three-eighths of an inch long with an inner diameter to match this part and an outer diameter to match this part. So when I slip that ring on, it will extend that bearing surface for that inner race. Now, Don and I have been talking, and Don says, well, why don't you make it a little bit uh, a press fit, and then heat it up and slide it on, and it should stick and never be a problem. I, I really don't want to do that. It may work fine, and if I had a grinder that I could trust to get this thing perfectly in place, I would do that. But I sure think that heating it up, if you get it hot on one side and not the other, you're going to distort that little thin ring so or a sleeve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to the best of my ability and best of Bob's ability is manufacture that, that uh, ring to go on here, the sleeve to come on here, and I'm going to make it just as perfect as I can to this diameter, put it in place. The outer diameter is going to be perfect to this diameter, so it just extends over with no hump, no nothing. And then green Loctite it in place, or red Loctite. I've got some red right here. So, that's my plan. I think everything will work. I think it'll be a, a pretty good machine after I do this. So I'll take some film of when I'm making this. I, I'm about ready to start. I don't know of another material that I have around here that's better than this for this application. And if I make it to where I don't have to heat it and it just slips on there so nicely, uh, I think everything's going to be okay. I may even turn a, a, a tool to this diameter so I'll have something to check it to fit on the lathe. And we'll go from there. Now, I think that this 303 stainless is a fine material to use for this. I'm not going to be heating it, uh, and it's tough. 
and uh, won't ever rust in there. So I'm going to try it. Now, if somebody has a different uh, recommendation for a steel to use, please tell me in the comments. Uh, if I can get it and it's not too much money, I'll do it. Uh, of course, this is right here in my hand. I think that's it. Wish me luck. Tell me what you think about it. Thanks for watching.